those of you who do not know who I am, uh, for about the last decade, uh, I was a spirit specialist at Davidson's, did all of the tasting, most of the tastings at that front tasting bar there, and some really great big events with the HRCA. My favorite of which was always the annual Tiki event. Um, I remember the last one we did, we had different tables around the room and it was like ports of call. You had to get your passport stamped for every cocktail. I thought that was super cool. And uh, hopefully we can all get back to doing that sort of thing again. Uh, these Zooms have been awful fun, but I know we're all itching to get back and have some cocktails together again. So speaking of cocktails, that's uh, really what we're all here for tonight. And I'm gonna throw a little history at you as well. The first one, I'll give you the history first, then we'll make the cocktail. And then we'll introduce, uh, uh, introduce Mar Mauricio for you to tell us about Florida Kanya. And then the rest of the night, we're going to do the cocktails first so that you have something to sip on while we talk about the drink. So this first one we're going to do tonight is a classic. And, and tonight's program is kind of broken down as the history of tiki. So we're going to start in pre-tiki. And that's going to be like your basic tropicals, which would be fruit juice, rum, you know, sugar, some kind of sweetener. And that's about it. Uh, the, the two big ones I can think of that are pre-tiki classics would be like the hurricane and of course the daiquiri. So the daiquiri is uh, kind of like the national drink of Cuba. Uh, it began its life as a cocktail called the Conchonchara, which was honey, lime, and rum. It became the daiquiri uh, after the Spanish-American War when the U.S. came into Cuba and started up mining operations. There was a town called Daiquiri that uh, one of the bigger mining companies was in, and there was a watering hole, of course. Uh, there was a gentleman who was credited with creating the daiquiri, uh, Mr. Jennings, I believe. He even has like a recipe for it. And I think what probably happened, there's myths and legends in all cocktail history, but really, if you really think about it, they probably were making him a conchinchara, didn't have honey maybe, substituted sugar for it, they renamed it daiquiri, Woo, there you go, the daiquiri is born. And uh, so anyway, the daiquiri, you know, picked up from there, became very popular all over Cuba and uh, became, you know, kind of the classic drink of Cuba. Another historical uh, thing I like to throw on uh, when we're talking about the daiquiri is the connection to Ernest Hemingway, who while living in Cuba and writing in Cuba uh, was said to have sat at the bar at the La Floridita in Havana and consume up to 25 daiquiris in one sitting. I, I hope that wasn't the kind of daiquiri making tonight because that would put him imbibing uh, 50 ounces of hard alcohol in an afternoon. Uh, and even though we are talking about Hemingway here, I, I don't uh, you know, suggest that anybody try that. Certainly not here tonight, which brings me to a good point. All of these cocktails that we're making are going to be full strength. And if you go ahead and you know, slam down all four of these while we're in this, this short time space, yeah, it could be a great night. It could be, you know, an iffy night. So maybe share uh, the cocktails you're making or the heck with it. Let's party, right? So we're going to start this first one here. Uh, the daiquiri, very simple. I hope you have all your bar accoutrements already set up. And uh, you're going to need ice. I got this really killer Florida Kanye, uh shaker here that we're going to use with this. Ice goes in the, the shaker. And here's a little tip. I'm going to give you a tip on these cocktails, especially with the tiki stuff. Because there are so many ingredients and because you can kind of occasionally mess up the proportions, uh, you want to do all of your regular juices and stuff first and save the spirits till the end. Because if you have to chuck it and start over, you don't want to waste the booze. So another tip here is to start out with your syrups, okay? Because these are gooey. They're going to stick to the sides of your jigger and you're not gonna get all of that beautiful flavor in there. So start with the gooey stuff, go through the fruit juices and finish uh, with your spirits. And as you go along with that, it's gonna clean out the jigger so you get all of your ingredients. So this uh, daiquiri recipe here, we're gonna start out with three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. I have basic, just regular old simple syrup here, white sugar and water. You can make a demerara syrup, which is really beautiful as well. But uh, for simply, simplicity's sake, We'll go with this. So we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of the simple syrup. And then we're going to need three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime. Those of you who have been to my tastings before, I know you don't have Rose's lime juice and a little plastic squeezy there on your counters, do you? You have real live limes. So uh, that's what you want to do. It doesn't take that long to juice a lime. So we're going to juice this lime here. 
I got one of these fancy things. Uh, you could use a regular like orange juice juicer. Uh, you know, you could cut them up into little pieces and squeeze a hundred of them, but that's going to take a while. So we're just going to go ahead and juice this sucker up. I've got little limes out here. I've been able to find. I really like the flavors on these. I'm not sure exactly what these are called, but they're different from the the big, you know, uh, Persian limes you get there in the front range. And I always found on the front range the limes had a little bit of a bitterness to them for some reason. So I would like dial down the lime juice and up the syrup a little. But uh, for some reason I, I find the limes out here to be a little bit sweeter. Don't know why. So anyway, here you go. Three quarters of an ounce of lime juice goes in there, and then. You're going to reach for, uh, you should have a sample that is the Florida Cana Seco White, the four year. So here's where this went a little haywire. Uh, when I sent Rebecca my uh, shopping list, I just put four year and she sent me the H four year. And I was going to buy one of the white ones at the store that I'm at here in Vegas, but we were sold out. So, uh, so I had some there earlier this week and they're all gone now. So that's a good thing for Florida Cana. We're moving uh, products here in Vegas. So my drinks are going to be a little bit different. No big deal. Uh, they're not going to be that different. Uh, but here we're going to go two ounces of your Florida Canya white rum. One. And two. And as I've talked about before, when we're making cocktails, if you got fruit juice, you shake. If you don't got fruit juice, you stir. So that's right. Tonight we're going to shake. And you shake for about 20 seconds. Uh, you can do a little dance, uh, you can, you know, count, you can, uh, you know, make a little song, whatever you want to do. But uh, I usually find that I shake until my hands are too cold to hold the vessel, and that's usually about 20 seconds. Here we go. Boom. Hit it. I'm at 12. What do you guys have? All right, there we go. Now, we've got our beautiful uh, daiquiri all shaken up with ice. You need a strainer. And of course, prior to this, you had a coupe glass chilling in the freezer, didn't you? No, that's okay. You got a coupe glass, right? Martini glass, whatever, doesn't matter. Any vessel is fine, but I really like the coupe. This is a very classic, uh, piece of glassware for this drink. And there we go, look beautiful. Your drink should be really lovely. Uh, I guess we could call that kind of opalescent, pearlescence possibly. Has really beautiful color to it. And uh, let's take a little sip off of that. Ah, that is beautiful. All right, that's your first cocktail, daiquiri. Let's hand it over to Mauricio. Chris, I actually have a quick question in the chat for you. Do you prefer white or aged rum in a daiquiri? I prefer to use whatever I'm in the mood for. I know that might sound like, uh, you know, I'm ducking out of the question, but honestly, the daiquiri, like the margarita, and occasionally the Mai Tai, is a drink that you can use as a blueprint uh, to build different flavors off of. So with your, your you know, your uh, uh, margarita, whether you're using like an Añejo, a Blanco, whatever, it's going to change based on that. Most people use the reposado because those vanilla notes go really nicely, uh, you know, with the lime. And then in rum, I find that I really do like the uh, the white rum for the classic. Uh, but I honestly, I'll even use like dark Jamaican rum. I think that's delicious as well. So kind of let it be your guide. If you want to go classic, hardcore classic, stick with the white rum. If you want a little bit more of that flavor, that oak in it, get some of the aged stuff. Okay. Oh. Great, thank, thank you, you. And I think we're ready for Mauricio. Yes, um, I have a, are you able to, to see my screen? Yes, we can see it. All right. Uh, by the way, just uh, uh, before I, I got in the Florida Canyon story, our white has a, a very specific characteristic because we age for four years. So uh, though we can take away the color of our four, but we cannot take away the years. So the character that gives to the uh, daiquiri or the tropical cocktails, it's awesome. Because you will find if you go to a, any, any bar and you ask for a mojito or a daiquiri, they will serve, if you don't ask for your uh, the, the spirit that you like, 
they will serve you uh, a standard spirit. In, in our case, we, we, took, we take away the color in our carbon filter uh, technique, and uh, but we cannot take away the ears. So the character still is, is there. I mean, it, it's, it's another another dimension of flavor in, in our white. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I think we lost your audio, Mauricio. We still can't hear you. Uh -oh. Chris, are you ready to do another cocktail while we wait for Mauricio to get his audio back? Uh, sure, if we can forge ahead. I can talk a little bit more about the factory too. I forgot to drop a couple of facts in there. Yeah, Chris, why don't you go ahead and do that? Oh, okay, I see. I'm looking at the screen and saying that. So, all right, so one thing I did want to mention, uh, since we're talking about tonight's cocktails, uh, kind of in a historical timeline, uh, the pre-tiki that I'm, I'm referring to here is, uh, so the daiquiri begins its life in the late 1800s, which, of course, precedes any kind of tiki culture at all, precedes prohibition. And Tiki in some ways was kind of born out of prohibition, um, but uh, this is a drink that, like I said, would be considered a classic tropical. And uh, before we ever, Tiki was ever an idea or a thing. And then post prohibition, you had so much rot gut uh, rum out there and, and bad, you know, bathtub spirits and all that kind of stuff, just horrible stuff. Uh, the way that they made it palatable uh, in New Orleans, a lot of bars would take uh, old rum runner run and uh, they would mix in you know, juices and different syrups and bitters and all, all manner of that kind of stuff. And that's kind of where things came from. Don Gant, who was Don the Beachcomber, which we don't have one of his cocktails tonight, but uh, he is certainly a figure you should look into if you're interested in tiki culture. Um, he is the one who's credited with kind of starting things off. He brought, he was a rum runner uh, off of New Orleans, and he brought uh, the idea of the, the tropical drinks to LA to his bar to where with the help of, uh, you know, like Hollywood um, set designers and special effects people, they made a kind of tropical, you know, mansion of sorts that had a rainstorm that went off about half an hour and uh, every half an hour. And there were all kinds of manner of, you know, tiki heads and stuff. It still wasn't called tiki quite yet, but it was getting there. And then um, we'll get to the next bit of history after that, but I did want to point out kind of the pre-tiki uh, uh, kind of reason of why we're starting off with the simplicity of the daiquiri. So do you want me to go ahead and transition into Manhoney juice? Let's see if Mauricio. Hello. Okay, we can hear you. Okay, let me let me go to the, to the presentation, please. Sounds good. I'm sorry. That's all right, we all get technical difficulties. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Are you watching the screen, uh, my presentation? No, we can't see it yet. Okay. Mm. Libby, do you have to switch oh. over to him? Okay, now try, now try Mauricio. Okay. What about now? 
Nope, not quite yet. Oh. Not sure what happened. Do you allow me to share the screen? Yes, I just gave you the permission, so you should be able to. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, Be very soon. Chris, quick question while Mauricio po pulls that up. Someone, an inquiring Bronco fan wants to know if your kitchen cabinets are orange. Our kitchen cabinets are indeed very orange. And here's the funny thing about it. We didn't paint them that way. They came with the house that way. We live in a uh, section of Las Vegas called Paradise Palms that uh, our house was from 1962 and built by Hugh Taylor, the gentleman who designed the Desert Inn Resort way back in the day. So this is a true life historic, we have a historic designation, uh, mid-modern house here in Paradise Palms. It's a, a really lovely place. And honestly, the, the cabinet color was one of the things that sold us. I was kind of cracking wise about the Bronco color, but it's so festive and fun. It's all about festive and fun. Uh, you know, so we were pretty pretty excited about that. Okay, I'm, I'm back on track. Awesome, we're ready for you. Okay, well, uh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Well, as you can see the screen, this is, uh, I can't we, describe. We actually can't see it. We can just see your folder. So you might have to stop share and reshare with the PowerPoint. Uh, we could skip the PowerPoint. Now? Nope, not yet. Now? No. Oh. I'm not sure what's happening. Um. Wing it. Yeah, do you want to start talking without the PowerPoint? No. Nope, still can't see it. Share screen. What about? Not yet? Yeah, it's pulling up. Yep, we can see it. Oh, finally. Okay. I can, if I can describe for the Kenya, it will be with this image. Uh, we are in Nicaragua, in the heart of the Americas, right in the middle, and we are known as the land of lake and volcanoes. We have 22 volcanoes and several are active. The volcano will be uh, the signature of Flor de Caña, will be our, our biggest ally, our natural laboratory. Okay, the story of Florida, this, as you can see, this is the tallest volcano in Nicaragua. And uh, the four pillars of the brand are in this. Oh, no. Uh oh, we lost him. Oh, we lost are you, him. Are you listening to me? Oh, we oh, can. We, we can now hear you. Can hear you. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. You're killing my buzz. All right, Mauricio, looks like we lost your audio again. I'm sorry. We can hear you, but you're cutting in and out. Well, now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Maybe it's the internet down here. Okay. This is, uh, oh my God. Are you listening? Yes, uh, but you're just cutting in and out. Okay. Let me go back. I think, uh, I think we're, we're okay. The volcano is the most important element in, in the brand. And one of the, the claim that we are very proud is that we are a sustainable run, sustainably produced from the field 
to the bar. And we have a history of 130 years family story with five generations. These guys are from, uh, arrived from Genoa, Italy in, in 1875 to Nicaragua. They want to fulfill the dream to build the Interoceanic Canal. But at the end, the canal was built in Panama because of this reason. Uh, as you can see, this stamp, this little stamp, Nicaragua has a 22 volcanoes, and the Panamanian took this stamp to the commission, the Canal Commission in the Congress of the United States, and they won for six votes, and they took the decision to build the canal in Panama instead of Nicaragua because of these natural conditions. So the Italian guy, Mr. Hello. Uh oh okay. The, the Italian guy, Mr. Are you listening? Yes, we can hear you. The Italian guy, Mr. Pelas, decided uh, to switch the business. His business was to uh, during he has the, the the concession of of in Nicaragua of these boats of these uh, ships because Nicaragua was important in that time to reach California for the gold rush. So if you want to reach California, uh, if you were in New York, it took six months by horses, or you have to take uh, to Chile. And uh, the perfect route was to take a steamboat in, in New Orleans, reach the Caribbean uh, uh, Sea, and then aim to Nicaragua, and only 35 days you can reach California. That's the importance of Nicaragua back in time. But when the decision uh, to, to build the canal was took, so he had to switch the business. And when you got, and, and he bought a sugar, a sugar mill. And when you got a sugar mill, you obtain two products, sugar and molasses. And that's how the story of Florecaña begins in 1890. Now we are a story of a five generation single family state. To be here, to be in the United States as a brand for us as, was very hard to us because we've been through a lot as a country and as a brand. One of the most, uh, er, we had it all, earthquake, landslide, volcanic eruption, uh, civil war, revolution, whatever, you name it, we got it. But one of, one of the most tragical events was this uh, airplane crash uh, where the, the four generations of the owners of the brand, they were in the in the plane, and uh, with 150 people, only 15 survived. The the wife, uh, the I mean, uh, the wife of the owner and the owner uh, miraculously survived, and he went to rescue her. And they, in that moment, the uh, plane exploded, and uh, they were get they get burned for 80 percent of their body. So this would be a dramatic event that it will turn in something good and you will see why. For us as a brand and this big pillar of the uh, family uh, and the five generation, take a look of this. I call this a dramatic statistic. Only three in 10,000 family business survive after the third generation. To reach the four is very hard, but to reach the fifth, only three in 10,000. For some mysterious reason, at the third generation, any kind of family business uh, goes uh, broke, off, broke off. So we are there. And this is one of the biggest pillars that we have. All, all our values are very well set. Our second pillar is that we are very proud to share with you that our Flor de Caña is absolutely naturally aged with our artificial ingredient. All the process of Flor de Caña is certified and there is nothing which is not naturally in the process of aging. This is our, our distillery. As you can see, we're very close to the volcanic chain, as you can see in, in the screen. And we are only five miles away from the Nicaragua's most active volcano. And what it has to do with us, well, everything. Let me tell you why. We only have two seasons, the rainy season and the dry season. 
When it's raining, the volcano captures a lot of water in the ladders. Those water goes beneath the soil and the soil is totally enriched by this volcanic material and organic material. Even the water that we have in our water wells in our 35,000 acres of sugar cane fields, this is just a sample of what we have there. But the, that is, has to do strictly with the, with the crop. In, in, in terms of the rum, the, the most important element is our location because the climate that we have there, it's, it's, our, it's very special for the aging in, in Florida Canyon. With the humid conditions and the temperature that we have there, we can say that to age one year in Nicaragua is almost like you can age for three years in a coldest temperature. Well, what happens is that if you're aging in a coldest temperature, the pores of the skin of the barrel of the wood is gonna turn, it's gonna get getting close. In Nicaragua, in, with that climate condition, the pores of the wood, it's open widely and transmit very, uh, in a more dynamic, in a more intense way, all the, char the organoleptic characteristic as aroma, flavor, and aging. So that is how we obtain our volcanic character. So the volcano became our biggest ally, our natural laboratory, as I said before. Flor de Caña, it's absolutely certified that we don't have any trace of sugar. Besides, we came from the sugar cane, we take away the, the sugar and we don't, we don't age in the process of aging any caramel or anything which is not natural. We only use three elements, alcohol of maximum purity, bourbon barrels and time. And also we are certified gluten-free and kosher certified. Our third pillar is our top quality credentials. Our portfolio goes from four to 30 years. This is the Florida Canyon family. And uh, we have, we start with a premium category, then we move to the super premium in our seven. And then we move to the ultra premium category from 12 to 30 years. The bottle of 30, of 30 years in, 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 this, in, in this screen, it's uh, our latest, a jewel of the family. It's Flor de Caña, five generations. As you can see, uh, this cap is a, an authentic volcanic rock. And this is a, the product inside is a single barrel from 30 years ago. In 2016, Flor de Caña uh, became uh, one of the most recognized rum in the world. And we, uh, let me see if you're able to see, to, to hear this video. You listen? We um, can't hear it. Okay. Okay. I will. I will pass the video. Some something happened in, uh, with the presentation. In this video, uh, in, for international wine and spirit competition, Flor de Caña was recognized as the number one uh, producer of the world. We compete against eight hundred different spirits. And we were evaluated by 400 evaluators around, or judges around the world. And we achieved the, nom the number one global rum producer of the year in 2017. Okay. Our four pillar, and we're very proud to share with you that Florida, we are obsessed with sustainability. Uh, our sustainability uh, model. We, pro we, we produce from field to bottle, and we are certified by Car Carbon Trust and Fair Trade. Take a look at this. In terms of environment, we distill 100% with renewable energy. We plant every year 50,000 trees since 2005, and now we are running a, a program with a, a strategic alliance with an organization that calls One Plant Tree, and uh, we are trying to, to plant 1 million trees around the world. All CO2 emissions during fermentation are captured and recycled. We don't let it escape anything. All the emissions of, of CO2, we, we sell it to the brewery industry in Central America. 
so we don't we don't we don't contaminate anything. That's one of the reasons, the elements that we've been certified by this organization, Carbon Trust, and we are one of the fewest around the world to be carbon neutral run. In terms of employees, since 1913, we have a school, our Maestro Ronero, he graduated in that school, uh, he went to the university now, is one of the most important uh, professionals in the industry because our solidarity program that we have in Florida Canyon. We like to say that we grow together, we grow with our people. And we have a free medical service with a hospital of the latest technology, free of charge for all the collaborators that we have in Florida Canyon. In terms of community, remember uh, the plane crash, this is the owner of Florida Canyon, the wife of the fourth generation, after 23 surgeries, uh, he miraculously survived, and he uh, he found uh, Aprocan, which is a hospital for the, all the children that get burns in Nicaragua. And Florida Caña is the main sponsor for that hospital. Also, our charity organization ANF is uh, in charge to housing, food, community water wells, and more. And we are one of the uh, main donors for that organization. So we grow together. In, uh, we also are very proud to share with you that Flor de Caña is Fair Trade certified. Uh, there is a fund with the workers that every do uh, there is a, a, a portion of the uh, amount, every bottle that is sold in the world goes to a program to build clinics, school, scholarship funds, housing projects. This is the one of the most important charts, uh, almost uh, finishing, because all the process, every step of the process to uh, produce Florida Caña is certified by the most important organization in the world. In terms of the sugar cane field, it's Bon Sucro. Also, uh, we are certified by the emissions with the, in the fermentation process. With the still renewable energy, 100% renewable energy, and we are naturally aged without any sugar, any trace of sugar. Recently in Europe, if you, if you are in Europe and you go to Amazon, you will find us in the climate pledge friendly. This is very important for us because this is, uh, uh, we, as, I, as I said, we are obsessed with the sustainability programs. That's the reason that we are certified carbon neutral and fair trade. Also, we were the winner of the prestigious sustainability award in London. And we are very proud in the making of Florida Canyon rum because of this model. We have the molasses, which is the raw material to produce rum. These enriched molasses, we fermented. We distilled five times. We produce uh, excellent, excellent liquid, excellent alcohol. Then we age in bourbon barrels and then we send the bottles to the United States. Take a look at this. An ounce and a half of Flor de Caña is only 60 calories, 61 whiskey and 61 vodka. 70% less than beer and wine. So the perception of sweetness is all for those rums that in the process of aging to simulate color or simulate aging, they add a caramel. Not in our case. Flor de Caña is absolutely natural. My premium fall certified that we are zero sugar and our global footprint. We are the number one exported brand in Nicaragua, fastest growing rum and the most eco friendly rum in the planet. That's the reason Flor de Caña has been chosen by, with a strategic alliance with the San Francisco Giants, as we are the official rum of the Giants, also the official rum of the New England Patriots and also the official rum of Houston Dynamo and Soccer. IGFA is an international conservationist organization of the selfish uh, catch, uh, catch and release, selfish and modern. And we also, we are the official rum of IGFA and the official rum of the 50 best restaurant in the world. This is an organization that every year, it's like a, the Oscars of 
every year is a, a gala and it's uh, named and recognizing the most important restaurant around the world with Ferrari and San Pellegrino. And Flor de Caña now, it's a sponsor, the sustainability award for those restaurants that are using uh, and recycle and has these sustainability programs uh, as, as, as a program. What makes Flor de Caña unique? Well, our four brand pillars. Five generation family rum, naturally aged with our artificial ingredients, top quality credentials as the International Wine and Spirit Competition and sustainably produced from field to bar. Thank you very much. Cheers. Hello. <laughs> okay. Thanks Mauricio. Thanks, Mauricio. Salud. I'm so sorry because I, I don't know what happened with the. Uh... You know what? You're in Nicaragua. It's going to happen. I saw some <laughs> questions. Somebody asking when the plane crash was. 1989, uh, in a trip from Managua to Honduras, our neighbor country. And that's uh, 150 people were in the plane, and only 15 survived. The the pilot survived. And two of them were from the, the Florida Canya family. Yeah, the, the father of our CEO and the, and the mother. Okay. That's about it. All right. Thanks so much, Mauricio. Chris, let's go ahead and turn it back to you. Chris, uh, I, I hope uh, to get down there at some point. Uh, Nicaragua has been a place that I've always wanted to visit. It used to be Costa Rica, but I hear it's all over run and stuff. So one of these days, I hope to get down there and see that distillery for sure. Run around in the jungle and drink some rum, because uh, uh, that's never a bad time, is it? So how's everybody doing? I uh, hope we enjoyed the daiquiri. And uh, we're going to move on now. So to the Manahuni juice. Um, and sticking with our historical thing, we're going to move from pre-tiki into, uh, this will be like the birth of tiki. And uh, the cocktail itself, we're going to go ahead and make now so that we have to drink while we talk, of, while I kind of rattle on about uh, Trader Vic. And you know I can do that, those of you who uh, I've talked with before. So we're going to start again. Uh, here's another little trick. I like to give my little tricks all the time. So with a drink like this, to where you're going to actually wind up not straining the drink back into the glass, but you're just going to pour the whole thing into it. Uh, here's a little trick. Measure your ice with the glass you're going to use. So in this case, for this cocktail, you want a double old-fashioned glass. If you at home have a rocks glass, or so, that's fine. But uh, double old-fashioned glass is what this cocktail would uh, be served in at Trader Vic's. Uh, over the years, my really killer Trader Vic's, my tie glasses have all gotten broken. But, uh, you know, now that we got the pull out back, uh, we have gone plastic. So this is a beautiful uh, plastic old fat, double old fashioned glass. And, uh, you know, for, for better or worse, I found these at Walmart. So there you go. And uh, we're just gonna put some ice in this. And here's the trick to this, is whatever glass you're gonna use for your cocktail, go ahead and fill it with ice first. And then take that and dump that in your jigger. And that way you got your ice pre-measured. And so this one, we're gonna start again with our gooey stuff. Okay, and so that's gonna be our simple syrup. Now I heard that there was a problem with the uh, orge samples. And if you have orge samples, throw them away, get rid of them. Um, they should have been refrigerated. And uh, you know, it's, I think if they're in their, their big bottle and everything, it's fine. But in the little sample bottles, I hear there was a problem with that. So go ahead and get rid of those. If you wanna mimic an orge, you can do like uh, half a portion of amaretto, half a portion of simple syrup. You just pull on amaretto or really just go all simple syrup. It'll be fine. It's not going to be a big problem for this cocktail. So that being said, I'm going to go with a fourth of an ounce, quarter ounce of simple syrup. Because we start with our gooey stuff first. And then I uh, got a quarter ounce of orge. This is from BG Reynolds. Uh, the one I'm using. You can buy that at Davidson's. This is an uh, interesting kind of bit of history, too. P.G. Reynolds is a company that started out as Trader Tiki, who was a guy who was on the uh, Tiki Central website, 
And if I remember correctly, way back in the day, he used to send syrups to, to people as gifts for holidays and stuff. And uh, I think he was like a financial guy. He lost his job, as so many did back at uh, that time. And people were like, why don't you make those syrups and sell those syrups? And that's what he did. And he has a beautiful line of cocktail syrups. You can find them online. You can go to Davidson to buy them as well. So this is his Orger, which is a true, honest to God, old school Orger. And we're going to go a uh, quarter of an ounce of the Orger as well. That's going to go in there. And then we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. So I got all my citruses down here. I didn't have a wide enough uh, lens here to show you my entire bar, like all the pros do, or how they have that second camera that shows what they're doing down here. We're not, we're not quite uh, Martha Stewart level here at the, uh, the uh, house. So you're going to have to imagine I'm cutting a lemon. You can probably hear that. Hopefully I won't get my thumb. Get a good knife too. I mean, I know it's nice to have like a little kind of fun little, you know. Uh, you said lemon or lime. Okay. Sharp knife, but uh, you know, I like this big guy. This looks like a freaking pirate's sword or something. Big fan of that. So <laughs> have as much fun as you can, right? We're all still maybe not in quarantine, but uh, we're still getting the crazies from being at home too much. All right, so three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. I'm squirting stuff all over the place here. Don't want to get it in your eye. It's going to sting like hell. There we go. Now, you know, a pro really would have measured these out uh, beforehand. But when I saw the run of show, I was like, I got to flesh these cocktails out a little. So I uh, just went ahead and did that. So here we go. Lemon juice goes in there. Then we're going to use a half an ounce of Quattro. Now, when I get to explaining the strength, this will be an interesting change, too because this drink is basically a Mai Tai modified and the Mai Tai used Curacao, but this drink does call for Cointreau. Now, I, like you, have many different variations on orange liqueurs in my bar and in my kitchen, uh, but uh, I haven't had Cointreau in a while, got that for this tasting, uh, took a little sip off it, and oh my goodness, is that good. So in a pinch, sure, we'll use whatever triple stuff we can, but really, the way the world's going, treat yourself. All right, so that's a half an ounce of Quattro, two ounces of your white rum, your Seco, uh, Fort of Kenya. Hey, Fabulous. Chris, real quick, I got a yep. question up on the board. Um, nope. You definitely agree that triple sec can be used as an alternative to Quattro, correct? Yes, Quattro is a top shelf triple sec. That's what it is. Yeah. And this cocktail calls for a lemon, correct? Yes, well, not a whole lemon. It's going to be uh, three quarters of an ounce of, uh, wait a minute, I totally screwed up. There you go. These things happen. Add the lime too, it'll give it a lot more citrus note. There you go, that's supposed to be lime. The lemon's for the next one. I am so sorry about that. I saw the lemon on the counter and grabbed that. You know what? Let's roll with it, what do you think? I could remake the drink, but I think we'll just forge ahead. Uh, <laughs> apologies to everybody on that. You know, this is going to be a new drink. So that's the thing in tiki culture, right? If you change even one ingredient, guess what? You've created a new cocktail and you get to name it. So uh, you guys talk amongst yourselves in the chat. Figure out what you want to name this. This is no longer a Menahuni juice, even though I'm going to explain to you the history of the Menahuni juice. But uh, y'all figure out what you want to call it. We'll christen a whole new drink here tonight. What do you say? All right, shake. All right, so this one, uh, instead of straining, we want all that froth that we get from the shaking with the ice. So you're just gonna pour that whole thing in there. And then you wanna top that off with a little bit more ice. Crushed ice if you got it. I don't wanna run back to the, uh, the fridge. That would be, you know, silly, whatever. But anyway, I'm gonna top it off here with some ice. There we go. Your traditional garnish for this would be the pineapple and cherry stick. Uh, that you would get at Trader Fix. Um, and then also you would throw in uh, a half of a lime to kind of signify the island floating in the sea of booze and then a little sprig of mint on there uh, for the tree. But what you really want to have is one of these. This is a swizzle from Trader Vicks in Emeryville, California. And that 
that little guy is a Manahuni. The Manahuni are little magical sprites who live in uh, Hawaii and uh, play little tricks on people and have fun living in the bushes and shrubs all over the island. And uh, Vic's whole thing was always that, uh, you know, if you have enough of these, you may see the Manahuni. So that's going to go in there as well. Now, what Manahuni juice is, is a drink that Vic came up with for folks who might not go crazy for the funkier aspects of the Mai Tai, his most famous cocktail. And uh, enjoy this drink while I, I go on and, and uh, talk about Vic. So as we said earlier, Don kind of started the whole thing. So we like to say what Don started, Vic perfected. Uh, Trader Vic started out uh, in his life as a gentleman named Vic Bergeron, who opened a bar in Oakland, California called Pinky Deeks in the 30s. And Hinky Dinks, over time, assembled all of these different uh, tiki items, outrigger canoes, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, he was uh, inscripted to, not inscripted, he was hired to start a bar in the Pacific Northwest called the Outrigger, which in 1960, and I'm kind of hurrying through this because this is a history that really we could do an entire hour on uh, the trader. And so in 1960, it was named Trader Vicks. And then he partnered with some folks and started opening Vicks all over the world. And it became, uh, you know, this uh, uh, culture unto itself. Vic kind of brought Tiki to the mainstream. So we say the birth of Tiki, it started with Don, but really hit its mainstream with Vic. And uh, if you're ever in California in the San Francisco area, you want to take the Bay Bridge over towards Oakland and then make a sharp U-turn at the end of it and go out there on that island there. Uh, that is Emeryville. And there you will find a Trader Vic's restaurant, which has been open since 1969. And when you walk inside, it looks pretty much like it did back then. It's one of the great tiki palaces. And uh, that's going to lead us into the next one we talk about uh, tiki palaces in the Valley High. But get back to that. Get back to the many hooty juice. Uh, also, you could say that Vic was trying to find a lighter kind of cocktail, you know, to balance out against the funkier Mai Tai. But really, honestly, Vic was a businessman. He knew the more options he had on his menu, the better it was. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, I came in here tonight. I'm in a cab in a hotel down the street. I don't have to worry about driving. Let's try six or seven cocktails on this menu. So the more cocktails he had on the menu the more you were, you felt like, oh, let's try this, let's try that, let's try this. So that's probably really what the Manahuni juice comes from. Uh, but again, this is really just a Mai Tai with white rum. So um, there you go, Trader Vic. As I said, we could talk forever about Vic. Um, show you a couple of books here I have. If you're able to run across these in a used bookstore, you certainly want to pick them up. This is his Bartender's Guide from 1947. This has all the classic cocktails in it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a few tropical things in here, but really it's kind of a classic bartender's guide. At that time, uh, you know, and, and all the way through the heyday, uh, the early tiki years, you know, th these drinks were secrets. They were kept under lock and key. They didn't want you to know how to make these at home. Why in the hell would they want you to do that when they want you to come to the restaurant and drop a lot of money on food and drink? And then, 1972, Vic updated his bartender's guide. If you're into tiki, this is the one you really want to hunt down. This is the one where Vic pissed everybody off and posted uh, or printed, here that we live in a digital world, posted, right? No, he printed all of the tiki secrets. They're all in here. All of the classic cocktails, all of the classic stuff that you won and that was kept secret for years and years and years. This is, uh, this is a treasure trove. And if you can find the 1972 Trader Pick Bartender's Guide, you want to do that. So there you go, Menahuni Juice, Trader Vic, the birth of Tiki, on into the heyday of Tiki. What do we think about this drink? Anybody? Are we seeing anything in the chat there about it? It's really good. We like it. Good. Anybody Thank have any you. Questions? Oh, no. I was just wondering if anybody had any questions on the, uh, the Vic era there. Chris, what's the cherry stick? You said it should come with a cherry stick. What do you mean by it? Yeah. Oh. So that's a garnish by where you take the, uh, 
this guy right here, your swizzle, and uh, it would have like a, a triangle of pineapple. Wow. And it should, I should have done that, and I apologize. Um, full disclosure, I've been having some horrific back issues, and the only reason I'm standing up this here doing right this right now is I've got far too much Advil in my system to care about anything, let alone pain. But uh, I have not been able to get out to the store and uh, get the stuff for the garnish. That's why I was explaining the garnish, but unfortunately not able to show it to you. I like the swizzle stick. Isn't that good? Yeah, it's beautiful. Do you have a whole packet of them? I have not a packet, but I have a whole bunch of them because anytime I go to a tiki bar, I take the swizzle sticks with me home. Now, that's the thing. There's been there's some, some bad behavior you can have at a tiki bar, and that is in stealing the mugs. Don't ever steal the mugs, none of you, right? Purchase them, they have them for purchase, but if you steal them, what happens? Their supply dwindles and they switch over to using like iced tea glasses and stuff, and that's no fun. But the swizzles are meant for you to take. So they print out thousands of these things, put them in your drink, and that's supposed to be your free souvenir that you take home. So, I mean, I can show you, I've got like a whole, I've got hundreds over here, uh, but here at the bar, I mean, I've just got this many right here. As you can see, there's one from Smuggler's Cove. There's uh, from uh, Frankie's Tiki Room here in Las Vegas. You know, swizzles are a lot of fun. Oh, here's a fun one. This is a great one. This is from Trader Sam's. This is the Tiki Bar that's at Disneyland. And it is one of the most fabulous times you will ever have once uh, Disneyland opens back up and everybody's able to travel again. Um, so there you go. Take your swizzles with you, leave the mugs at the restaurant. Some person made a comment that they added the amaretto and they really liked the touch of it. Good, and that is uh, that is something that is totally legitimate in tiki. I know I've talked about this uh, before and uh, it kind of as tiki devolved and the fern bar came to be, and we'll get into that in a minute, uh, really a lot of places that you would ever see these, these drinks on a menu whether it's a scorpion bowl or a zombie or any of this, was at Chinese restaurants. And the Chinese restaurants would minimize, and I don't know that you would be able to find orge syrup, so a lot of times they would just sub in amaretto because it's almond, right? It's, uh, it's an almond liqueur, and sub that in. So a lot of those drinks that were on those menus would have the amaretto in it anyway. And it is very nice. Uh, it's just not classic, and, you know, we're going to stick with that. But for the longest time, if you wanted orge syrup, I think... You know, yeah, Tarani, I think, has made one all these years, but, you know, there was a, a long time that this stuff was not available. Yum. All right, so we want to go into the next one here. This one has the lemon. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. But I gotta be honest, the minute this does not suck with the lemon instead of the lime. Not bad. It's really not bad. Okay, but we're gonna go on uh, to Mr. Valley High. Now, this next one, uh, you're gonna want a tiki mug, and I'm gonna explain that in a little bit. I've got mine. This is from Forbidden Island in Alameda, California. And uh, this is where I originally met Mr. Martin Kate, who uh, at the time was the bar manager at Forbidden Island. He has since moved on. He's opened uh, an amazing place called uh, Smuggler's Cove in San Francisco. That is uh, one of the great, great tiki palace or bars. I can't call it a palace. It's not that big. It's uh, tiny. It's uh, really, compared to some of the tiki palaces, it's a closet. But, man, you want to go and you want to get in there and, and get some good stuff. Uh, I believe, God, what does he have, like 500 different rums at that place? Anyway, I get crazy. So we're gonna move on to the Mr. Valley High. We're gonna, like we did uh, with this drink, we're gonna make the drink first and then I'll tell you the history of it. And uh, now I have to switch my shakers. So you gotta be perfect, gotta have several shakers in the house, right? Okay. Once again, we're gonna measure our ice with our vessel. I've got a tiki mug, I hope you do too. And if you don't, it's not a big deal. You could use an American pint glass, would be fine. I know everybody has those. Living in Colorado, you know, you can't go into a store without uh, picking up a pint glass from some beer wrap somewhere. And bless them for it, you know, free glassware is the way to go. All right, so the ice goes in our shaker. This one, <coughs> we're going to start with a third of an ounce of simple syrup. Now, 
some of you may not have a jigger. Really awesome OSO jiggers. You can find one of these or order it uh, online. This is like the best jigger I've ever had in my life. Um, this does have it. Now, to kind of just, you know, you could do a quarter and a little extra if you don't have a third measure. So we're going to go with a third of an ounce of the simple syrup. That's going to go in our shaker. Next up, I'm going to pour one and a half ounces of pineapple juice. I've got a weird vessel for my pineapple juice. Uh, here's something strange. I freeze my pineapple juice into cubes, uh, those big, you know, the, the big rocks cubes. I've got one of those uh, ice uh, molds in there. And I freeze it to, because I don't make these drinks that much anymore. Um, but when I do, I want to pull that out and then I've got like four ounces of pineapple juice. So there you go. Here's a, the pineapple juice. I'm going to do an ounce and a half. I, you know, use whatever you got. I like the Langers, if you can still find it. That's got pulp in it. It's, it's like the best commercial pineapple juice on the market. Now we come to our lemon juice. So we're going to need an ounce of lemon. So I have a little bit left. That one, I'll cut up this other one here with the Pirate Saber. There we go. And I'm making all kinds of a mess up here today. You should see this cat. Cats are going to stick to it next time they walk across. There we go. Here's our ounce of lemon juice, fresh squeezed again. Please do not use the little plastic lemons. All right. So this is where this gets a little weird, right? So we're using coffee liqueur. What? So there's a whole subclass of tiki cocktails uh, that use pineapple juice and coffee together. together. And the combination is amazing, uh, these two flavors together. I don't know why pineapple and coffee work so well together, but it is just lovely. So I was really happy to hear uh, that uh, Florida Kanye has this uh, coffee liqueur, this espresso, espresso, espresso liqueur called Espresso. I find this a little bit more vibrant, a little bit more sharp uh, than the Kahlua. I think it's uh, definitely a much better product, uh, but it's also uh, just adds a little bit more of a vibrant zing of flavor instead of that kind of mellow, you know, coffee candy kind of thing. And I really dug this. I think this is going to be good in this. So we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of the espresso. And just to let people know, our new espresso liqueur is decaffeinated. And it's blended with our own estate grown <laughs> sugar cane and as well as the seven year. So we utilize the seven year in the blend of the coffee liqueur. And I really like that it's decaffeinated. It's a great after dinner liqueur without the caffeine. Yeah, I'll have to remember that. That's great because there are like a lot of drinks that I want that have a coffee flavor, but it'll keep me up all night. Now that I know that, I'm going to finish this bottle like tonight. <laughs> so now we're going to do... One ounce of the four-year Seco white. That's going to go in our shaker. There and we go. Seco, by the, by the way, Seco is dry. Dry, dry white. There we go. And then we're going to do an ounce and a half of this beautiful Florida Canyon seven-year ground reserva. And that's going to be a full ounce and a half of that. So, which brings me to a, a good point about tiki cocktails is, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of have this misconception that, you know, tiki cocktails are kitty drinks or, you know, they're, you know, uh, why do I want to drink that girly drink or whatever? I'm like, give me a break with the, the tags, right? My, drink, my wife drinks Lafroy. I don't want to hear about girly drinks. But those kind of guys uh, who say that kind of stuff have a rude awakening sometimes, especially when they get a hold of a, a drink like the Jet Pilot, which has 151 in it and a whole bunch of rum. So the tiki cocktails, you've got to be careful with because of the amount of alcohol that is in them. Um, as I talked about earlier, Vic's uh, menu would have so many different things on it. And myself, I've fallen victim to this myself in Emeryville or at Smuggler's Cove or wherever to where I sit down. I'm having a great time and taking a vacation through the menu. And then I go to stand up and, whoa, <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, you definitely need somebody to drive you home or Lyft or Uber or do an event like this, we're all, we're all home already, right? All right, so there's all our ingredients. We're going to shake this really well. You want to shake the heck out of this, folks, you want some nice froth, uh, especially that pineapple juice will froth stuff up really cool. So here we go. Mm. 
when a mixologist is shaking, everybody applause. <laughs> I would be dancing around in my back when there is them. There we go. Oh, look at that froth. I don't know. Can you see the froth there? You guys should see it anyway. You're making this at home. All right, we're going to pour that whole thing in there. Look at that. Oh, this is the Mr. Bally High. Now, let's see here. I've got these straws, uh, you know, they're paper, save the turtles, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to throw that guy in there and we're going to take a little sip off of this. Oh, hey, I hope you guys like this. Go ahead. I got, we have our, our sustainable straws. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Got to have them. Got to. That's really good. So I hope you all can see what I'm talking about, the way the coffee and the, uh, the pineapple work together. It's really vibrant. It's very pleasing. It's very savory. And uh, that's a word we love to use, savory. So yeah, would, you all say, would you say it's meant to be drank with a straw? What's up? Would you say it's meant to be drank with a straw or is it okay otherwise? Oh, you can drink it however you want. But I'm saying if you, if you order this at a bar, at a restaurant, it's definitely going to come with a straw. And uh, I would imagine it would have a garnish too of like maybe a pineapple, you know, and a cherry thing on it, that sort of thing. Um, mm, which leads us into talking about um, the Bally High itself. So uh, the Bally High is one of the grand tiki palaces and it exists in San Diego, California. Uh, you can go visit it today. It's a living, breathing museum of tiki. It has been updated several times and that's a really cool thing in our culture because some of these places are, you know, they fall into disrepair, they become a restaurant, they become a sports bar, they become a, a firm bar, and then they just kind of go away. But uh, they're really beautiful tiki palaces. People put the time and effort into it. There's the Tonga Room in San Francisco, uh, which is fantastic. The drinks aren't the best in the world, but it doesn't matter because you're in, you know, a restaurant and a hotel that has a lagoon with a band playing in it on a boat. And there's a thunderstorm with rain showers that happens every 20 minutes. I mean, it, it doesn't get better than that, right? And then you have the, uh, the Mai Kai in Florida, which sadly the roof caved in on the Mai Kai uh, uh, last year. And they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Hopefully they're going to, you know, rebuild the, the kitchen and renovate it and get that going. Because I never got to see the Mai Kai and that kind of hurts my soul. Uh, I kind of really want to get out there and do that. Then you've got Trader Vic's in Emeryville, and you've got the Bally High in San Diego, which has been known for a long time as, as being a long time uh, Tiki Palace. And this kind of leads us into the historical uh, portion of tonight that would have to do with the heyday of Tiki. Okay. So again, Bally High, uh, you know, uh, started in the 50s. The cocktail, Mr. Bally High, came around in 1957. Now, it is true that a lot of these places had their own mugs, and that's kind of like why I want to talk about a tiki mug, is that they would have their own personalized mugs, but the Bally High really took it one step further. They had their signature cocktail, Mr. Bally High, and they had out in front of the restaurant the Mr. Bally High statue. It's kind of like a headhunter guy, but then they made a mug of that statue. And you, when you ordered the cocktail with the mug, you got to keep the mug for an extra fee, right? So this is really interesting to me, and it's also exciting to me that uh, this is going to lead into the next chapter, which is the rebirth of Tiki directly. And you'll see where we're headed with that in a moment. But, uh, you know, so what you had happen was in the 70s, uh, these things started creeping in called the Fern Bar. Now, some of you may be old enough to remember the Fern Bar, probably not going there and hanging out and partying, but maybe you were kids and you went, you went with your parents to have dinner and that kind of thing. And, you know, they had drinks like the Cosmopolitan. They had the Grasshopper, the Harvey Wallbanger, these kind of things. And uh, the, the Fern Bar really is kind of credited with killing off the bars. Uh, places started to close because uh, the fad was dying out a little bit. You had some really heavy-duty stalwarts, which, of course, Valley High is one of them, Tiki Tea in Los Angeles, 
um, you know, different ones, uh, different trader VIX that held on in big key markets like Chicago, um, here in Vegas, uh, Los Angeles, et cetera, et cetera. But the big ones like the Down the Beach Comer in Dallas, uh, Trader VIX in Dallas, uh, which is the first TV bars I went to, they started going under. And uh, it was a real drag. You uh, lost a lot of um, really delicious food and drink uh, to the way of, you know, really, I, I guess, I don't know, uh, poofy hairstyles and polyester, I guess. But it is what it is. That's the way things go. And uh, take another sip of that while I gather my thoughts about the Jungle Bird, which is going to be super cool. So we're going to finish up this segment on Valley High with a little story of a gentleman uh, by the name of Jeff Berry, who at the time was still just Jeff Berry. So Jeff and his friends from LA decided to drive down to the Valley High. They had heard of this kind of cool uh, tropical restaurant that we're gonna go check it out. Uh, this is probably somewhere around 1990. So they went in and uh, Mr. Berry had a Mr. Valley High and he had another. And then he asked about the mug and the gentleman who was serving the drinks was like, oh, well, you get to keep the mug with the drink. He's like, oh, okay, we'll have another one. I love this mug. Then by the fourth one, he said, well, we're going to have to order another So I want four mugs. And the waiter told him, you know what, you don't have to do that. I've got hundreds of these downstairs. You can have them for like two bucks a mug. So uh, Jeff was like, oh, great, that's fine. But he still had a fourth one anyway is how the story goes. This awakened the idea, uh, and it was probably already there, I think. Uh, Mr. Berry decided uh, that he wanted to start hunting down different locales of still surviving uh, historic tiki locations. And uh, he started interviewing bartenders who had worked there and started reassembling these lost cocktails that had been lost during the Fern Bar years. And um, his first book was released uh, as The Grog Log. And this was kind of the first shot across the bow for the resurgence of the whole tiki thing, right? Uh, if you want to credit one person, or pick one guy, say that's the guy who started what's going on now, it's Jeff Berry, who became Jeff Beach Bum Berry uh, when he released the Broadwalk. And uh, so who knows, without that fateful trip to the Valley High, I don't know if we would have all the great recipes that we have from him, all the great books, uh, he has a bar in New Orleans called Latitude 29, which you should definitely visit once we can all start traveling and get back out there. He's a great guy. I've never met him in person, but he and I have had traded a lot of emails over the years because I had a lot of questions about Tiki. And if you can, why not go to the freaking source, right? So Jeff spent a lot of time digging through, you know, garage uh, boxes and stuff for little pieces of napkins that had, you know, uh, different recipes and things like that. But I'm going to save where that goes while we start our next cocktail. Did we like the Jungle Bird? What do we think? We have some good comments. We have one that says, this is wonderful. And someone said, delicious. Love the coffee accent. Good. Awesome. We like when people are happy, don't we? <laughs> Chris, what was Hi, the gentleman's Julie. name? Was it Beach Bum Jeff? Jeff Berry? Was now Beach, Beach Bum Berry. Beach Bum what? Beach Bum Berry. Got it. Thank you. There you go. His name is Jeff Berry. He's, uh, he's like the guy who restarted all of this. So we're going to move on. I'm going to make this next cocktail before I go on to the next segment of, of talking and talking and talking. But it's a good thing that we have something to sip on while we're doing that, right? Okay. So for our next one, we are going to make... The Jungle Bird. And this is a delight. Now, the reason I wanted to finish with the Jungle Bird today instead of the more, uh, you know, dessert-like Mr. Valley High is this drink uses Campari. Campari has a bitterness to it. Uh, but, you know, I think on my palate anyway, it lingers a little bit. So I didn't know if that would lead into the other drinks uh, that well. But it's also nice, too, because in a lot of European cultures, you use a little bit of bitterness uh, to kind of cut off the, uh, the desire to eat and drink more. So maybe it's good that we save this one for the end. So again, we're going to take our vessel. In this case, I'm going to use uh, this little white glass here. It's clear glass. 
Uh, you would use probably Collins glass for a jungle bird, I think. But the, the color on this drink is so pretty, we want clear glass for that. So again, I'm gonna measure my ice by using the vessel that the cocktail's gonna wind up in. We're gonna throw that in here. Okay. We're gonna start with a quarter ounce of our simple syrup. There we go. And we're gonna do a uh, ounce and a half of that pineapple juice again. See how healthy this is? These are health drinks. <laughs> You're getting all kinds of fruit juice and stuff. All right, there we go. An ounce and a half of pineapple. We're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. So uh, you guys with your big, uh, the big Persian limes that I remember being out there, you're probably gonna just have to use one. I gotta use two. Give me just a second here. Pirate Saber. Anybody come up with a different name for the Menahuni juice yet? <laughs> All right, lime. All right, hey, that was perfect. One lime yields three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. Boom. So here we go. Here's the Campari. Um, Campari is kind of like a love it or hate it kind of thing. In this cocktail, it's not that big and bold and abrasive. It plays really nicely with all the ingredients. But uh, one of my favorite things about Campari is in the Life Aquatic that uh, Steve uh, Zissou, arguably the most bitter man on the planet, drinks the most bitter liqueur on the planet. Uh, <laughs> on the and I love that. I absolutely adore that. All right, so we're going to do a half an ounce of Campari right here. And then we'll finish up with an ounce and a half of this beautiful seven-year Grand Reserva. There we go. That's going to go in here. And again, it's shaking time, my favorite time. Who doesn't love to shake? Here we go. Beautiful day here in uh, fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. Come see me sometime. All right. Who's going to be the jungle bird? Ooh, look at that. All that soft pink color. Really lovely. Nice froth on it from that shake. It's all about the, the, the froth, right? And you would use usually like a nice kind of uh, uh, pellet ice with this. And the secret to that, if you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on the pellet ice machine, is just go through your Sonic drive through They'll sell you a bag for $250. Best ice in the world. I don't know if you guys can see that in this glass or not, and if your glass is doing the same, but it does this really cool kind of creamy movement uh, on the ice there that's really kind of uh, interesting to me. And then... Um, I'm going to use for my garnish this little guy. Whoa. This comes in the potted parrot at Trader Vic's, but since this is the jungle bird, we're going to use this guy in here. So that's our swizzle for this cocktail. And throw a little thing in there and take a sip of that. Oh, yeah. See, I love that. I love Campari. I love the way that when you use it in a cocktail with all these other sweet ingredients, it brings a balance to everything. And that's so nice. Yum. All right. The Jungle Bird and the history of the Jungle Bird. The Jungle Bird begins in the 1970s in Kuala Lumpur, of all places. And because of that, it became a beloved drink to businessmen who went to Kuala Lumpur. But it didn't really get that popular at the time because not that many people go to Kuala Lumpur, right? Maybe they do. But this drink never really caught in in uh, true tiki times. And also, like I was saying, in the 70s, you had the fern bars coming in, pushing tiki out. So it was one of the great lost kind of things. But the, what is really cool about the Jungle Bird and why we want to finish up our history with it is, is Jeff Berry was the guy who kind of relaunched uh, the tiki thing. Modern day tiki you can make the argument, you can really kind of point to the Jungle Bird as being 
the cocktail that kind of helped relaunch things. There's all the classic stuff about Vic and the Mai Tai and all of that, but it can't really get moving until you get something that people can, you know, the hip people, right? The cool guys can get really excited about. And hey, a tiki cocktail with Campari? Oh yeah, the, uh, the twirly mustache people are really into that. Nothing against them, just saying. But um, so the deal here with the Jungle Bird is, is Jeff Barry was, really, he had released the grog log uh, and then he came across doing research for his next book he came across a recipe in another bartender's guide of something called the Jungle Bird. And he was like, what the hell is this? Campari, Jungle Bird, this sounds like a tiki cocktail. So he included this drink in Intoxica. So uh, Grog Log was pretty popular with the cool and hip folks, you know, um, who were really into tiki already. Now, Jeff had already started making a name for himself. And uh, there were some tiki bars here and there popping up at the time. Um, but in 1990, he released Intoxico with the Jungle Bird in there. Now, you wouldn't think one cocktail out of a whole book full of cocktails would have that much of an impact. You're wrong. So there were bars named after the Jungle Bird. Uh, if you go into any tiki bar in this country worth its weight in uh, lines or whatever, it's going to have a Jungle Bird on the menu. So instead of just having all of your classics on there, the Jungle Bird really helped steer the ship in a direction for people to take it in a whole new, uh, you know, uh, way. People like Martin Kate, um, you know, people like uh, Suzanne, who was at uh, Forbidden Island and had the bar Longitude in Oakland. Um, all of these folks who were like trying new things and, and starting this stuff. And around 1992-ish, I remember my wife and I moved to. Um, Phoenix. We had been living in Texas. There was a tiki bar in Austin. I don't remember the name of it, but both of us had grown up uh, with parents who went to tiki bars, grandparents who went to tiki restaurants would take us along with them. And, you know, you would see these exotic drinks, but you weren't allowed to have them. Now we were allowed to have them, right? So we already had this memory in there. Why it was a perfect kind of uh, confluence there of what Jeff Berry was doing and uh, the re kind of invigoration of Tiki with the Jungle Bird and his drinks, new bars opening up, and this generation of people who were raised on Tiki, but more kind of like, you know, uh, the, the Enchanted Tiki Room at Disneyland, you know, are seeing these drinks, or not drinks, but the restaurants as exotic. But now we were old enough, as I said, to imbibe ourselves and really enjoy that part of it. It was kind of like a, a you know, boom, there it was. So when we moved to Phoenix, there was a bar called Adrift that was open, and it was the first kind of modern-day tiki bar that my wife and I really went to uh, ate for and loved it. And then everywhere we've moved over the years, whether it was NorCal, SoCal, uh, you know, uh, with Denver, we've always gravitated to the tiki bars. And there's a fantastic uh, newborn tiki culture out there, great drinks, great food, but at, at the center of it all, a camaraderie, around this really fantastical uh, cocktail fad that's been going on for decades, uh, that it's really, it's not about actual true Polynesian, uh, you know, history. It's not really about anything real at all. It's all fantasy. It's all about on the snowiest day in Denver, Colorado, you can go into a building and sit down and have drinks, and some food and listen to some exotic music and you go on vacation for a few hours. That's what Tiki is. And that's why it means so much. And there you go. Hope you enjoy. All right. What do we think of the Jungle Bird? Great feedback. You know, one of the um, patrons mentioned that had a little bit of a bite. What do you think about subbing out the Campari for Aperol instead? Yeah, you could uh, reduce the bitterness by using Aperol, for sure. You could also use, and uh, there's a, so at home here, I don't use that much Campari. I, I have to have it for certain drinks, but I use a bitters called Maletti. You can find that one. That's real nice, too. It's a little bit rounder, a little bit more sweet. But there's some cocktails that if you don't have Campari, you're just, your host. So there you go. But yes, you can dial that down by using the Aperol, which is lovely. Somebody's asking where you got your shirt, Chris. <laughs> uh, this 
This is a Kahala shirt. This comes from Hawaii. I got this shirt in uh, Calistoga, California, of all places. I don't know what Calistoga in the heart of wine country had a surf uh, kind of clothing store in it. But uh, my wife was the uh, quality control manager at Calistoga Water while we were living out there. And they were having a sidewalk sale. And this damn thing was only 30 bucks when, you know, marked down from like 100. So I had to have it. And uh, it's fabulous. <laughs> I've been told that in Hawaii, the Kahala shirt uh, is fine for every occasion, including the boardroom. So really, I'm dressed formally this evening. <laughs> so real quick, let me get back to, uh, we're talking about Beach Fun Barry and uh, the restarting. He's got a lot of books out there, uh, buy whichever one you want. But the one that I really recommend is Read Mixed. Uh, if you can find that guy, you want to get that. Uh, he, he's got great books. Get them all if you can. But if you only want one, Remix is the one to get. This has all the, I think, best. Uh, it's got more recipes in it and less kind of chatter. I love the chatter, but if you're looking for just a good cocktail book, that's the guy. So where are we at? How are we doing? What is Campari made from? Boy, that's a good question. I wish we had a camp party uh, prep room because I can't tell you. It's uh, gentian. Gentian root, I believe, is at the heart of most of your bitters, whether they're Amaro's or Campari or Aperol. Also citrus. It'll be like dried citrus peel. Um, a lot of people will think that it is uh, grapefruit, but really it's more bitter orange, like the Cara Cara orange or uh, some of these types of things. So citrus, gentian other herbs and things like that. Uh, it'll be a neutral spirit base to it. Uh, sometimes it'll be like a grape spirit base, uh, not quite a brandy, but kind of, you know. And, and by the way, Chris, the owners of Campari are the same owners of Ferrari. Oh, that's right. <laughs> They're living fast. Yeah. We just watched the uh, Ford versus Ferrari here a couple of weeks ago. Great movie. <laughs> too much lemon and lime well and that's uh that's valid i think um you know a lot of these cocktails these tiki cocktails can be overwhelming in their sweetness so a lot of recipes will dial up the citrus and also as i was saying when we started uh the citrus especially the limes i don't know why this is i don't know if they come to stay frozen or where the majority of limes in Colorado come from. But I do remember uh, during my 10 years in Denver, when anytime I made tiki drinks with lime, I would cut the juice down by a, a quarter to a third. Uh, so the traditional Mai Tai recipe calls for up to an ounce of lime juice. I used a half an ounce. I had to cut it down to that. Uh, otherwise, it was just too bitter. So I'm going to guess that might be it. I'm using, I don't know, a, the difference... These are just limes. They don't tell me what kind of limes they are, but uh, they're little, they're smaller than most of the, uh, the Persian limes I remember getting in Denver, and they're a lot sweeter. And you could also use uh, key limes. So a lot of these cocktails, when they were invented, uh, the tropical cocktails, whether it's in Florida or uh, Louisiana, wherever, they were using key limes. So if you have the patience to cut and juice like 10 limes for a drink, have at it, because uh, the key limes are really tasty. But uh, that may be the issues, uh, the limes there along the front branch. I don't know. Th those limes has seeds? My limes do not have seeds, no. Well, it's Tahiti. It's, it's the Tahiti uh, variety. Gotcha. So the Tahiti variety has no seeds, is that correct? Yes. Ah, good to know. Good to know. I like that. Anybody have any other questions? We got a good name for uh, the cocktail. I lost it on the thread, the Lanai. L-A-N-A-I. Oh, I can't seem to find it now. The Lanai. I think that's what Maria Kelly had suggested. I uh, love the, so does everybody, is everybody aware of the concept of the lanai? Everyone should have one. We have one here. I've always had one everywhere I've lived. From my understanding of it anyway. And uh, 
And Chris, by the way, uh, we are uh, promoting this month around the world in Florida Caña. We call the Zero Waste Month. So we have a program. Nice. Yeah, with different different ambassadors around the world, different restaurants, to try to reuse all the the leftovers of the bar uh, to oh. produce a. Not, not to throw it away. You, you can you can reuse uh, the oranges, the limes, whatever. Yeah, I've heard something about a syrup that's made from like the discarded uh, uh, citrus peels and stuff too. That's, uh, oh, yeah, sacrum. No, no, it's uh, it's a different thing. There's a, a gentleman. I can't remember if it was Oregon, Washington. I think it was in the Pacific Northwest somewhere. He came up with this really cool syrup. Uh, that he was using, all, he, he didn't like that they were discarding all of the uh, the peels and stuff and just all of that going to waste and getting thrown away. So he started, and it wasn't the oleosaccharum, it was a, a boiled, it's a whole process. Uh, he boils it down, he adds different herbs and things to it. And I saw it online and I got very excited about it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to make this at home. And, and the more I read about it, I was like, okay, maybe I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a good oleosaccharum is fabulous, though. I do like that. But I like Lanai, and I had to go and look up and see if there was already a cocktail named for Lanai. And I'm finding a cocktail named Lanai, uh, Lanai Glider, but that's the only one. So there you go. Our cocktail that we made tonight, that's the Lanai. Isn't that great? Oh, we got some other good ones. A Lemmy Hooney. That's cute. <laughs> a Lemmy <laughs> A Lemmy Hooney. Another one commented, where, where was it? The 12 Mile Lanai. Yeah, I don't know. Hi, maybe. There you go. You know, that is a, a different road not taken. I always had the idea of doing a, a small uh, tiki bar in Denver along the lines of the Tiki Tea in LA that was just a hole in the wall that made really awesome drinks. And I wanted to call it the Mile High H A I. And I even went as far as to design a logo for this. And uh, like all great ideas, or not all, but most great ideas, it just wound up sitting on the desktop of my computer for a long time. Oh, well. If anybody wants to use Mile High as a bar name, go for it. <laughs> you know, uh, Richard had just made a good suggestion about utilizing agricole. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the difference of agricole and rum. So agricole is much different from industrial rum. So most rums, and I can talk about the history of rum for sure, uh, one of my favorite subjects. So what you have to understand is, is where rum comes from. It is honest to God, uh, it is the byproduct of industrial waste. So you have sugar production, which the byproduct of that is molasses. And uh, what they used to do is just throw the molasses in the sea. Uh, it was trash, get rid of it. But somebody had the bright idea, uh, or probably not bright idea, but realized that they left a container of molasses out and it fermented with natural yeast and stuff and, and made a, uh, a wine of sorts. You know, everybody's looking for something to make themselves a little bit happy, especially when maybe they're, you know, uh, either island people conscripted or the Irish conscripted and stolen away to uh, plantations in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, something to make them happy after a hard day working in the cane fields. So, and then somebody further got the idea, well, let's ferment, or let's uh, distill this. And that's where rum is born. It, it honestly comes from molasses, which is the byproduct. Uh, that being said, there's another style of rum, which is agricole. Agricole comes from the fresh pressed squeezings of sugar cane. Uh, there are very good agricoles out there that will make you have very happy. And there are very bad agricoles out there that can put a big frown on your face. I'm not going to name names, but uh, agricole is a designated AOC by the French government, uh, really just for the island of Martinique. Now, there are a lot of producers out there who produce agricoles, call them agricoles, even uh, a, an American company in Baton Rouge that makes the best damn agricole I've ever had in my life, even though it's not a legitimate AOC agricole. It's made in the same method. So here's the deal uh, with agricole. It is crucial that you get from the squeezing of the cane to the fermentation as quick as you possibly can. The longer you wait, the more off flavors you're going to get. Uh, so as quick as you can. And the, uh, 
the plantation there in Baton Rouge that does it, the gentleman told me they're able to get juice to fermentation in under 30 minutes. And that's pretty awesome. I've had some agricoles that are obviously are taking a little bit longer than that. And they're horrifying. But anyway, the island of Martinique, uh, there are some good pr producers. There's uh, La Favorite, there's Nissan, there is Clamont, JM um, uh, Rum, right? We don't get that this far. I can't remember exactly. Also, uh, the Rums Barbon Court from Haiti. Those are, while not legally agricole, they're made in the agricole style. So it's got to be from the fresh pressed cane juice. And they have a, a very beautiful flavor of, of grassiness, I think lemongrass. If you've ever been anywhere, and I grew up in Dallas, so we had this. We had a farmer's market where they had fresh sugar cane to where in order for my mom to get me and my brother to shut up so she could shop, she'd buy a sugar cane, you'd snap it, you'd chew on it the whole time. And that that smell of fresh sugar cane, the grassiness, the bright freshness of it, that stayed with my whole life. So that's what I do love about agriculture. Uh, to get into a subcategory of agriculture, you have uh, this fabulous stuff that's really starting to come around here in the United States. People are realizing that it exists uh, called Clarion, which is a Haitian uh, backyard kind of agricole thing. Uh, if you're familiar with Mezcal from Oaxaca, you can think of kind of Clarion in the same way. It's uh, in, in Oaxaca with Mezcal, you have backyard palais that make uh, homemade agave spirit. And in Haiti, you have these backyard, um, you know, sugarcane spirits, and they are really, really cool. They're funky as hell, but they're super cool. I think the best agricoles don't strive to be super clean and approachable. They strive to be just uh, natural and funky, and I do dig them. Did I ramble on enough about agricoles? <laughs> Sorry. I get very passionate about this stuff. Hi, uh, Chris. Just, just to let yeah. you know to, to the audience, the first name that the run has was back in the island in the Caribbean, and uh, the British called that name Kill Devil, and then yep. they moved to Rumbuyon, which is yep. a, that's the, the very first name, and Rumbuyon became in Rum. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a historic da data, the, it's supposed that the origins of the sugar cane it's from Papua New Guinea, and Christopher Columbus brings to America in his second trip in 1493, and that because they were interested to produce sugar cane in this uh, area in the world, specific for sugar, not for rum. But then they fermented naturally, and that's how the story of the rum begins. Sure, and uh, the Dutch were producing as well, even in uh, Indonesia, uh, there's some injury. Batavia, Iraq was uh, kind of the rum of Indonesia at the time. Um, so you had like the Dutch and the, the Spanish and, and all of them running all over the tropical areas looking for spices and sugar and, and things like that to bring back home. And uh, rum kind of is born out of that. Flor de Caña, Flor de Caña, it's in the Hispanic category. And we can name. Yeah like big three category, like the, the French, which is the agricole. Right. The, the, the British or the English has a very, like a funky style from uh -huh. pot still and the Hispanic, yeah. the Hispanic rum, which is our, the Hispanic style or Spanish style, which is Flor de Caña. Mm -hmm. final, final honeys or industrial honeys or from molasses with yeast and water. And delicious. Yes. Good stuff. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, rum was my first passion. Um, oh well. Okay, my first love was uh, bourbon, wild turkey to be specific. But when I really started getting nerdy with uh, spirits, it was really uh, the, the tiki culture that brought me into all of this stuff. Starting to make these cocktails at home, but then meeting people like Martin Kate, who uh, was like, why don't you try the base rums that go in these drinks and, and starting to drink all these different things and learning about uh, the Spanish style rums and the pot still rums that came from Jamaica and, and Barbados. And then, uh, you know, those agricoles and all of that. It's an amazing 
uh, not only history, but just a flavor journey to go through this stuff that I don't think you have this array of flavors, this diversity with any other spirit in the world. You could say maybe whiskey because there's different locations, you know, Scotch, Irish, American, whatever. But I, I don't, th I think you have way more uh, diversity in rum. And that's why if you go down that rabbit hole, uh, you're, you're going to be down there a long time. <laughs> and it's pretty fun, you know. And I tell all of the, the audience, if, if you put a, a little a little bit on the palm of your hand, a little bit of Rolecaña, just a little bit, and then if you rub your hand, in a very few seconds, you will have any speaking sensation at all. The reason why is because we don't have any trace of sugar. The yes. color is natural. We don't add caramel, so you can you can do this, and we we call the five senses protocol, and this is the the, the touch, and uh, in a very few seconds your hands will be totally dry with no sticky sensation. Um, we, there is no trick. That's a great. That's a, that's a great point to bring up. There's a big debate about rum and uh, sugar additives. And yes, that is something that, uh, I mean, among many things to love about Florida Kenya, it's also another thing to love about them that they don't dose their rums. There's a, there's a lot of producers that will put uh, sugar in there to tart up the flavor, not tart up, but, you know, uh, boost the flavors uh, beyond uh, the actual uh, rum itself. Uh, you can be sure that Florida Kenya does not. You can be sure that the rums of Barbados, Foursquare, and uh, Mount Gay do not. You can be sure that Appleton or really anything, uh, it's illegal in Jamaica to add sugar post uh, distillation to the rum, so that's nice. There are some producers who I will give a pass. And the number one producer on that list is going to be Plantation. Uh, they actually use a partially fermented cane syrup to kind of sweeten the rums and round them out to the flavor that Alexander is looking for. Some people say this is fakery. And uh, I think they're wrong because it doesn't hide the fact that they do that. There are plenty of producers out there. I don't want to name names, you know, since I'm in the business. But if you order a rum at a restaurant or you purchase a rum and you take it home and it has just these really sickly sweet caramel and fruit notes on it, it's a good chance that there's a decent amount of sugar in there. And like Mauricio was saying, what you could do as a test is just, you know, rub it between your hands like this. And then once it's evaporated, if it's sticky, then you've got a lot of sugar in that rum. And, you know, uh, especially for folks who have to watch sugar content, things like that, that, that is uh, something to pay attention to. Thank you very much. Hello. All right, I don't see any other questions, so we can go ahead and end this. Thank you so much, Chris and Mauricio, for your expertise. And Chris, we would not be able to do this if you weren't so passionate about Tiki and all its history. So thank you all again for joining us tonight. I hope you learned lots about the history of Florida Kanya, as well as the history of Tiki cocktails and enjoyed the cocktails, courtesy of the one and only Chris Motley. Thank you again to Chris, Mauricio, Marcy, Davidson's Beer, Wine, and Spirits, and Florida Kanye Rum. These events would not be possible without them. Thank you for joining us, and have a great rest of your night. Thank you, Chris. You Thank, you, Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Mauricio. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo.